Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This episode of the Bob Thurman Podcast was originally streamed summer 2020. To enjoy the full video version of this episode, please visit the Tibet House U.S. Menla online YouTube channel. Now, I don't think anyone is here who doesn't know who you are and how wonderful you are. Sharon has been a wonderful contributor to the programs at Tibet House and at Menla and has been a staunch uh, supporter with us. She also loves the Dalai Lama. He loves her. And um, he, she really represents uh, just a, a very great kindness, you know, in the Dalai Lama's idea that his he has the common human religion of kindness. I think Sharon very much exemplifies that in her life and in her writings. So with that introduction, Sharon, meditation master, Sharon. Great Sharon. Oh. <laughs> <Woo. Woo. laughs> well, thank you so much. It's, okay. it's so awesome to see you and be yeah. with you. And virtual space is such an odd thing because now I'm really missing Menla as a physical location uh and tibet house but um here we are you know and, and yes. uh what a triumph really that we managed to be together and it feels so close and I, I know. and wonderful that so is great. That is great. um you know as some of you who've, who've tuned into anything that i've taught lately know that i i came up here march 14th thinking it was for a few weeks i was in new york city and just feeling uneasy and I thought well I have a house in Massachusetts I have a retreat center of course which is now closed the Insight Meditation Society and uh, I came up here with my snow boots thinking I'd be here for two weeks and I'm still here uh, but I have connected a lot with people as, as best I can so so that's really great something that I am really uh, really looking at a lot these days and talking about a lot these days, which is the quality of rest, just resting our attention, not trying to block the maelstrom of thinking and feeling and everything that may be going on, but having some space. Well, don't you find that people are generally speaking kind of exhausted? Absolutely. They really are. It's just, uh, it's, um, it's part of this time especially people like the many people in your book who are really trying to do something about this, the pain and suffering that is going on all around us. And it's, it's such, it seems so huge to everyone. And they feel so gripped by doing it. And um, then they never can do enough, as you, as you point out. And... Um, that's what I love about the book. I think really it's your best book yet. Really, I really Thank think you. so. Sure. It Thank really you. is. It's wonderful. It's like, you know, it made me think what I thought of that I hadn't thought of in relation to the book until that moment of rest. I thought of the power, peacemaking, the power of nonviolence conference in, uh, in uh, San Francisco in 1997, where you were present. And um, where there was a collection, it was a, it was a conference with the Dalai Lama and um, uh, Jose Ramos Horta and um, uh, the lady from Guatemala, the other noblest from Guatemala, her sister, actually. And then lots of other activists from all over the country. And you and Joseph and uh, I think Joseph was also there and Jack and all Jackie. the all the meditation coaches, also Zen coaches and other kinds, they were doing this great service of joining all the different activist meetings and trying to introduce into the into the sort of 
atmosphere of the of the activists, this notion of sort of inner peace and inner calm and inner self care to try to help them with burnout and so forth. And all of you already by that time were, were sort of big stars in your in your in your own right in the Dharma world at least and 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 more. And yet you you were there serving the activists in this selfless and wonderful way. I really remember that. And I just thought of it now in relation to the book where you're bringing along uh, the, this new generation, uh, maybe a few from the old time, but kind of new generations of activists. And you've so much gotten to know so many of them, many that I don't, I, I don't know. And, and you are learning from them while teaching them. And so you're, you, you are like a whole movement, really, in the book. <laughs> you're like a whole movement. And yet you're, you're making the movement practical and sustainable. And I think that's really wonderful. I really do. I, I was surprised when I first read it. It was so much bringing others with you, you know. And then yeah, I, at that yeah. time, I know I thought of the Hillary's book, It Takes a Village, you know. You, yeah, you, you, yeah. The book is a village of a lot of creative and wonderful people. And you're serving them by helping them bring along their heart in a way and nurturing and nourishing their heart. I think it's really wonderful. Meanwhile, also, like any great teacher, you are learning from them and, and sharing what you learn with us. And it's, it's outstanding, really. So, oh, so how did it, so, so I'm not saying you started on it at that conference. You've been so activist before that and after that. So how, what was your motive in the book? It was sort of the open leading question that I thought. Yeah. What, are, what are you trying to accomplish and what, how, how did it come out for you and where is it going and all of that? You know? Let it please. That's great. Us. Thank you. Well, I, first I want to say I think that was the best conference I've ever been to uh, after yeah. a lifetime of going to conferences, I will say. Yes, I, I exactly. think it was actually the best one It was ever. amazing. It really it was, was amazing. It really was. And I mean, you couldn't have, you know, I mean, you obviously planned it because you worked so hard to create it and, and keep it organized, but there were just moments there that were, they just happened. They were so extraordinary. They really were. And, and uh, I remember so many different things like um, being backstage and walking by uh, Alice Walker, who was just having a conversation with some people, and, and I overheard her say, uh, as I get older, the thing that matters to me more than anything is goodness. It's good heartedness. Oh, yeah. And I walked on by and it's been like such an important message, you know, for me. Yeah. yeah. I get older. Yes, uh, absolutely. And I was just like casually overhearing something backstage. And, <laughs> and at one point there were a number of gang members there. And uh, at one point they were standing in the aisles. And I remember, uh, whoever had, you know, brought them and was sort of organizing that said, I want you to raise your hand if you know someone who's been killed by gun violence. And all these hands went up. Oh. And, you know, and this was before in America, we sort of got used to, you know, well, if you go to the movies, if you go to church, if you go, you know, school, yes. that might happen to you. But it was like, it was so amazing to see the world that had been created with, Mm -hmm. with violence um so and that they were coming through the other side mm -hmm. you know was just the most amazing thing and of course his holiness the dalai lama was uh almost took the role of a uh, supreme student you know yeah, sure. and, and you know was was learning and absorbing it was an amazing amazing conference <laughs> so I really thank you for that conference. It stayed with me for all these years. It was very important. And yeah, yeah, I mean, I think I, you know, I had a lot of different motives in trying to think about writing this book. Um, one was I realized I've done a lot of work lately uh, with caregivers, mm -hmm. you know, first uh, domestic violence shelter workers, then international humanitarian aid workers. And these days, a lot of frontline medical personnel and, mm -hmm. uh, the things that they go through reminds me so much of what activists go through, really being mm -hmm. on the front lines of suffering and dealing mm -hmm. with a system that can seem intractable and needing mm -hmm. to find some balance and burning out and, mm -hmm. you know, the grief and so many things. And mm -hmm. so that was part of what motivated me. And part of it was like my world of, um, you know, 
uh, meditation people. You know, I've been mm-hmm. teaching now since 1974. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I just know so many people for whom practicing some form of meditation really opens their hearts and they feel mm-hmm. a, a different kind of compassion, but they also may not feel they can do much, you know, mm-hmm. that whatever they can contribute is so insufficient or so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. little or, or whatever. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and uh, the example I keep using, because I've seen it so many times, is somebody, and so many people have come to me and said, as an example, I, was, I started meditating and then I was taking a walk on the street and this person came up to me and asked me for a dollar. And I gave them a dollar because that's my, my habit. And mm-hmm. it's the first time I ever looked this person in the eye and realized it was a human being. Mm-hmm. You know, I've heard that over and over and over again. But what that person doesn't necessarily then do is think, well, what's the housing policy in the city that so mm-hmm. many people are on the street? You know, mm-hmm. we're not necessarily mm-hmm. trained to look for causes and conditions in that realm. Mm-hmm. The way we might be in an internal um, exploration, and so mm-hmm. uh, I've known so many meditators who want to contribute something or make some kind of difference, mm-hmm. and uh, they don't feel they have the the agency or mm-hmm. or something. So I wanted to address that as well. And then I think the third thing, which became really important to me, was born out of this conversation I had. Um, with bell hooks and who's an iconic feminist writer and mm-hmm. friend of mine. And she was telling me, um, actually, whenever I describe bell, I usually say I'm used to the, I'm used to Buddhist scholars, like parsing a word and like picking it apart and getting precise. <laughs> and, and she's even worse, <laughs> which is why I think she's such a good writer. And, and she said to me, I don't really like the term, social action much because i think it makes you feel like you have to march you have to protest that's the only expression she said what about art Uh uh-huh you know what about creativity that dissolves boundaries and breaks through Uh uh-huh you like others another sense of possibility you know so i'm looking at that absolutely gorgeous painting behind you you know in that light and Uh and so that became an important thing for me to try to include in the book as well it was just Mm -hmm the notion of creative endeavor as mm-hmm. something that mm-hmm. brings about social change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. I think it, it very much comes through. And, 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 and you you know, his holiness has that slogan, uh, which is, I mean, it really means heartfelt, you know, world peace, through inner peace you know he always says you know and i think you you are presenting a very useful inspirational uh, guidebook on that along that line how to keep the balance i think you you know you very focus on equanimity toward the end I, that's when I, I was a little late joining the the, the the online because i i was caught up reading toward the end you know and your focus on balance and equanimity. I think it's so valuable. Drew, is there a passage or something you'd like to read from the book? Uh, that, I don't, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't prepare anything like that, so I don't really know, but I'll tell you a story okay, about okay. the book, and then I'll okay. think if something else comes to mind. Okay, okay. Um, you know, I did include uh, a lot of other people in the book in the sense of, you know, they were interviewed. I have quotes from them. I have their oh, stories. That's what's awesome about you know, them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And some of the people um, were people from, this is about equanimity. Some of the people were people from the Parkland community mm-hmm. uh, where, of course, there was a school shooting and uh, 17 people died and were killed. And um, I went there a few years ago, not too much after the, the shooting, and I taught. And there was a young woman there, um, Samantha, who's in the book, and uh, uh-huh. who I just interviewed the other yes. day for something. And um, her mother was a teacher at the school. She was there that day. She she was safe, but there was hours and hours and hours before they knew. And 
Mm-hmm. And Samantha, being very involved in the community in general, got very involved in like organizing marches uh, and uh-huh. you know things like that. And so when I was down there teaching the first time, uh, she raised her hand and she said, "You know, I feel really weird because this is like an an amazing experience. It's like such an incredible thing to be here." And I know the only reason it happened was because that horrible thing happened. And I don't know how to get over that to really appreciate this. And I said, I don't know if you ever get over it. I think we learned to hold both. We learned to have both. So the other day I was interviewing her. Uh, uh-huh. It was sort of part of my book launch, my virtual book launch. Was, right, right. Was these different um, interviews that I did uh, mm-hmm. on video. And, and I said, do you remember that? And she said, not only do I remember that, I think of that every day. She said, that's equanimity, right? Yes, yes. You know, <laughs> so, so she was using that word. And, uh, you know, so I, I saw through the lives of a lot of people the living reality of the teachings. Uh-huh. You know, having uh-huh. compassion and, and uh, uh-huh. having a sense of honoring one's innate dignity. The book almost starts with, the story of this woman, Chantel, who's a, uh, one of the leaders of the striking fast food worker movement um, mm-hmm. in New York City, striking for $15 an hour minimum wage and the right to unionize. And, and I met a number of people you know, in that community. And, uh-huh. and uh, they had often say, you know, first of all, they have nothing. They work very hard and, and they were often living like in homeless shelters because they couldn't afford any rent and things like that. And, but they'd often say, you know, my parents, even my family said to me, don't do anything that might rock the boat. You have almost nothing. You're going to have nothing if oh, you yeah. lose your job, you know, and just yes, like, yes. don't, don't make waves. And, yes. and she said, basically you come to a place where you realize inside you're worth something and you can't just like take it anymore. Uh And that sense of innate worth. And she said, and I look at these young, younger kids Mm -hmm. and I think, what's there going to be for them? You know, she said, I don't do it just for me. I do it for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, you couldn't get a more beautiful example of the teachings, you know, like the innate innate dignity of everybody and everybody has Uh worth and, Mm-hmm. You know, we should respect one another in that light and so on. So I really, I did learn a lot. I mean, so much of our culture here in the States tells us not to look at suffering, not to admit it, to feel yes. ashamed of it if it's our denial. own, to hide it. Denial, denial, someone else. denial, yes. But the idea is not to open to suffering and crumble, you know, and just exactly. fall apart. We need some sense of inner resource. We need some ability to meet it. Uh, and have some equanimity, have some mm-hmm. compassion, and so mm-hmm. on. And so mm-hmm. uh, part of that whole process is being able to take in the joy. And uh-huh. you can feel so guilty, and it's, like, wrong to somehow admit it. And that was the story about a, a friend of mine who wouldn't let himself eat a banana, you know, and he was also <laughs> very depressed, I think, about it. Those were not totally unrelated things, yeah. you know, so... Uh, and, and you were implying you were implying that when he when he would take a banana and peel it, he would then think of all the farm workers who harvested the bananas who were suffering so badly yeah. in the feudal likes of Guatemala or wherever it was. Yeah, the yeah. thumb of the the overseer and all that. And so then he couldn't eat the banana. You know, it suffered so much, but he he didn't want to eat it because he would be guilty, you know. I mean yeah, I, and, I, I mean he's, he's not wrong in his vision yeah. or wasn't wrong in his vision, but Nonetheless, you know, uh, there's a certain place in which you need to replenish, you know, exactly, and you need to have some joy and otherwise you're not going to be able to be with the suffering and have any energy, you know, yeah. to try to do anything. You're just going to collapse because it's hard. It's very, well, very hard. Yeah, but also, actually, they did finally get the banana yeah. <laughs> harvested and it got to him. A lot of people were abused along the way, but at least they got him a banana. Yeah, and so somewhere in there... Uh, Enjoy it and be thankful. You know, that's another... Yeah, I mean, I was upstairs in this house reading the book for the audio version because uh, it wasn't a studio to go to. And uh, 
at some point I say, will you just eat the damn banana? <laughs> Which I thought was a very funny line. <laughs> you know, just eat I the damn it. banana, you know, already. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, maybe you need the potassium. Maybe you cheer up. Maybe you could work harder. You know, if you weren't so, because it is it is a difficult balance for us because we do need to admit the suffering, which doesn't come readily for most of us because we're taught to avoid it and or be ashamed of it. And on the other side, uh, it's something that always intrigued me about the Buddhist teaching was that suffering is not the point, you know, like it, it's That's not right. redemptive in and of itself to be yeah. broken by suffering, to be embittered by suffering, to feel mm -hmm. it's only me, you know, to feel isolated by suffering. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the point. It's not what's going to free us. It's having a whole other relationship to the suffering and to joy uh -huh. as uh -huh. well. And so uh, what are the ingredients of that other relationship? It has to do like for that woman, um, Chantelle, it has to do with self-respect in the best possible sense of understanding mm -hmm. our innate potential. Mm -hmm. It has to do with being able to take in the joy mm -hmm. and and be uh, kind of metaphorically fed by that, not just the banana, you know, mm -hmm. and and to, uh, to kind of see more deeply into the nature of things. So uh -huh. that's what um, this practice is uh, – is really based on that. So this is another another practice we can do together. So the passage starts out with, uh, in order to have the resiliency to face difficulties, for example, a friend or client who can't be helped, or a day full of sudden changes outside of our control, we need to find and nurture the positive parts of ourselves, and make a point of paying attention to experiences that give us pleasure. Mm -hmm. Too often we focus pretty much only on what's wrong with us or on negative, unpleasant experiences. Mm -hmm. We need to make a conscious effort to include the positive. This doesn't have to be a phony effort or one that denies real problems. Mm -hmm. We just want to pay attention to aspects of our day we usually overlook or ignore. Mm -hmm. If we stop to notice moments of pleasure, a flower poking up through the sidewalk, a puppy experiencing snow for the first time, a kind interchange between strangers, we have a resource for more joy. Mm -hmm. This capacity to notice the positive might be somewhat untrained, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. We practice meditation for just this kind of training. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what follows is a practice. And I just want to say uh, a little bit more about that before maybe we do that practice, if you like. So, Good. Yes, please. Um, it's really, uh, you know, it feels like maybe it's the most selfish thing in the world, and, and yet it's really essential to be able to take in the joy. And mm -hmm. um, again, when I, I did this evening uh, the other night as part of the book launch with this community from uh, Parkland, one of the people on the panel was Fred Gutenberg, who's a very active gun safety person. His daughter mm -hmm. was killed in, in that school shooting. And he has a book coming out called Look for the Helpers, that famous Mr. Rogers quotation. You know, mm -hmm. when he was a young child, mm -hmm. very disturbed by the world, his mother told him, look for the helpers. There are people oh. here, you know, who oh. are helping. So part of it mm -hmm. um, is being inspired, being buoyed up by the people who are trying to do good in this mm -hmm. you know, really difficult situation. There's some mm -hmm. story uh, in the news about a school in uh, Minnesota, I think it was, which was a place that was distributing food to hungry people in the community. And, uh -huh. and they put out a call for literally seven bags of food Mm -hmm. So they could give it away, and they got twenty thousand. <laughs> you know, so I think of that, and I think maybe we'll be okay. You know, <laughs> yes. Look at that. You know, there is wow. goodness. There is care in this mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. You know what I love is you know the Buddhist teaching has the four immeasurables, right? Of love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And so you, you have Im imbibed that pattern, of course, yourself so thoroughly in your practice. 
of what is unique about you is you bring it into sort of simple things in the daily lives of people who are uh, they're, they're not involved in dharma practice and whatever, but they're just involved in good heartedness. And you provide a sort of a handle into those zones for those people without freighting it with a lot of dharma sort of thing, you know. And that is so helpful and so kind and so effective. It's really, really, really great. I really like that. Thank you. I want. To, I mean, there's of course a quote from you in the very early on in the book because the underlying theme, uh, in a way, is interconnection. Yes. And how one of the reasons something like loving kindness or compassion is actually a superpower. It's not a weakness or something saccharine yes. and gooey. Sure. Uh, is because it's closely aligned with the truth of how things actually are. So yeah. this is a shout out to Larry who wrote a, a, something in the chat. Um, hi. Oh, um, yeah. It's so good to see you here. And uh, I, uh, somebody sent me a quote of me from like 10 years ago or something, which is always an interesting experience. And yeah. because something I, I have been saying all along is, uh, or since then anyway, is that uh, interconnection is the way things actually are. Right. And it doesn't take a spiritual understanding to come to that. Science shows us this. Economics shows us this. Environmental consciousness certainly shows us this. Even epidemiology mm -hmm. shows us this. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because of Larry and friends, I've been using the term epidemiology mm -hmm. all these years. And people used to say to me, what's that? You know, like, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. Uh, oh, you mean Larry Brilliant? You mean? Yeah. Yeah, right, right. You know, so here we are. <laughs> like, you know, uh, this is this is the truth of things. Look at this time that yes. any illusion we had that what happens over there will nicely stay over there and what we do doesn't matter. Yes. It's just dissolved. And so that's why loving kindness is so powerful. It's because it's the most natural response to seeing mm -hmm. things as they actually are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Uh, have you seen Larry on CNN? He's on a lot now. I, I see him. I follow him everywhere. <laughs> <Big dude. laughs> um, you know, and the quotation from you is one of my favorite things to quote, which I'm sure I use more often than you do, which is imagine... You're on a subway, oh, and right, right, right. these Martians come, and they <laughs> zap the subway car so that those of you who are in there are going to be together forever. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? If somebody's hungry, you feed them. If somebody's freaking out, you try to calm them down, not because you necessarily like them or approve of them, but because you're going to be together forever because our lives are interlocked. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is so much the truth of how things are. Guess what? Mm -hmm. Our lives really are that way. And as mm -hmm. alone and isolated and mm -hmm. apart as we may feel, it's just not the truth of things. Mm -hmm. That we are really do live in an interdependent universe and everything follows from that. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, Lama Govinda tells a story about in some inter-religious conference, he was talking with someone who was sort of putting down uh, Theravada Buddhism by translating equanimity as uh, l'indifférence in French, indifference. You know, the opeksha, you know. Opeka, you know. And they were, they were saying, well, you have love there, yes and then compassion, and then joy, immeasurable joy, and then, and then indifference, and you don't care. Ultimately. And he was saying, he used to say how, how he, he corrected him in that conference by saying that uh, in, the, in, the, in the rising through the four stages, love, compassion, joy, and equanimity, that the next st each stage up carries the full energy of the stage below. So they're not, it's not at all indifference. Equanimity doesn't mean you're indifferent to anybody. It means you're totally loving, compassionate, and joyful about everybody. So sometimes I'm tempted, or in some context one translates it as impartiality. You know? 
you know, equanimity because of the danger of people thinking that means you don't care about anybody because you're all, it's all equanimous, you know. The adjective is, is, is terrible, you know, equanimous <laughs> looks bad on a page. Equanimous, you know, <laughs> looks yeah. bad, but equanimity is okay. Anyway, I think that's really wonderful. And I was looking at that. I'm looking a lot at Abhidharma nowadays. And I was looking at the different factors of the different, um, the different immeasurables. And so the factors of the ones, you have a kind of joy and a kind of rapture and delight that lifts you into the first one and two. And these, these drop away in the upper ones, but that's because their goal has been reached and you have the love and the compassion and the joy, and it's all embedded in the state, so you don't need any more factor. You still only have the balancing, you add the balancing factors. And it wouldn't be that dropping away if, if in fact, you were, you were just leaving the whole lower state. No, but I, I, you don't see that uh, because they don't care if they're meditating and they're realizing that, so they don't emphasize that usually in the actual Abhidharma book. They don't. Well, you, I also quote you in that, uh, you're the you're the person when I say, even even scholars and translators, meaning you, uh, have come to me and said, "Well, you don't really need to say loving kindness. Stop being so cutesy. Just say love." Uh, <laughs> oh, but I mean. like that you do. I, on the other hand, I, I I like that, and I and I right, I say where it comes from. I at least I I believe I know where it comes from, from the the reaction to missionaries, who came to bringing the Bible and saying love, 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 and then they did horrible things to them. So they wanted to add, like, the Asian people say, yeah, loving kindness, right? <laughs> they wanted that because they were treated cruelly, you know, uh, with, uh, with the waving uh, Jesus' you know, uh, book, uh, the book, you know, the good book about love. So they, they, threw, they just wanted to make sure kindness was in there. And I think that, therefore, it still has a role. I think it's still very good, I think. I mean... You can fuss about it in the, in the translating time, but in the long term, but in the short term, it's very, very useful to have there. And um, you know, that was the funny thing, you know, about Mary Trump's book. You know, I read the book. I don't know if you looked at it. Maybe you spared yourself that one. <laughs> but, but what's surprising about it is because she, she kind of wants to guard the world against this rather difficult bully uh, bully that she's experienced in a family, you know, and her father experienced rather badly. But actually, when she analyzes his upbringing and the whole thing, it ends up building great sympathy for him, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because he was so, uh, he was so, you know, like, had such a harsh, it was such an abusive childhood, and to, and he was so neglected and uh, and and abusive in the sense of of um, absence of affection and genuine, you know, what, what the psychologist calls the mother's, the uh, uh, a more healthy mother's active, you know, mirroring of positive emotions to the ch infant, you know, the two-year-old, the one-year-old, you know, and the cuddling and the hugging, you know. He was utterly deprived of that. And she, she, she analyzes that very well. And I think, I think somewhat unintentionally, ends up where you feel even more sorry for the poor guy. Maybe everybody doesn't, but I did. I've always felt sorry for the guy, you know. And, and, and what a disservice to him, you know, the Russians and the various people, to put him in a position where a guy who has trouble caring for others because he feels so uncared for himself has to be in a position where the job day one is to care for everybody. You know, that's the service of uh, someone with that kind of responsibility, really. I mean, people talk about power, but it's really what it is is responsibility. And when they can't, they can't even imagine what it is to take responsibility, they're in a terrible situation. It's really, really a suffering, actually, I personally think. And it's amazing. He hasn't collapsed, actually, to me all this time. He has, you know, eats bad food, you know, like, he has weird flattering weirdos around him who are exploiting the situation because of his craziness. And he still gets, he can't, doesn't get enough feedback, you know, he can't get enough affection from anybody. It's really dreadful, poor thing. Anyway. So I'm that's why, I mean, you're, you're exhibiting kind of the fact that compassion doesn't have to 
be a weakness, that it can be a strength, which is a yes, big mystery for of course, people. Of course. You know, they, they, there's a lot of fear, I think, that we're one to have a kind of empathy or compassion, either one or both, you know, for somebody whose agenda you feel is incredibly damaging, that you will stop fighting. Yes. Yes. You know, that you will stop, you'll just kind of give in because compassion yes. is is giving in, but it's really not at all. Not at all. Not real compassion. And, uh, well, that's another thing. You you addressed the whole issue of empathy fatigue versus compassion fatigue, I thought, very well and uh, and very practically, you know. I I do tend a little to the Bodhisattva thing of infinite empathy and infinite compassion, you know. Which, which, of course, we normally are really not capable of. So what you are dealing with is dealing with the reality of the people, and that's good. But in a way, it's also not bad to have, an, to have that template, of the ideal, somewhere lurking there. <laughs> you like the Dalai Lama, you know, I love what he says, you know. Well, the way he explains, you can, you can feel it when he explains it. When he's in that position where you, which you described so well, of where you feel all alone in some misery, and something is really overwhelming you, and nobody ever had it as bad as you had it, and it's so awful what it's happened to a dear one or a near one or someone someone that you care about or even anyone. And he says when he, he gets that, and then the way he helps himself, he gets out of the being completely crushed by it, by empathy, is to open to more empathy and more compassion in the sense of thinking about what's happening to other people sort of like people do for schadenfreude, of at least that's not happening to me, but he doesn't do it for schadenfreude, or in a, uh, in a way, maybe it's a like a schadenfreude, but it's, a, it's a, for a positive purpose, and that is he sees there's so much suffering by broadening his openness that then he realizes, well, there's no, nothing for it but to gather positive energy, and what is that? And that's, that's what you touch on in your practice cultivating joy you know in a way the, if, if the gap between immeasurable compassion and equanimity which has all compassion and love and joy is to find the joy it's like looking at the really sick or the suffering person and seeing something good in them where they kind of have a little maybe they're not showing it then because they're in agony but there are things in them like where they see a flower or where they temporarily see some redeeming silver lining in some aspect of something. And so then the wish for their joy, them to, ha to enjoy the joy that they actually have is what that, and for that becomes then a source of your measurable joy, which, which gives you the energy to cope with what you discover through compassion. Mm -hmm. Without the joy, without some power of, the joy is the most powerful. And so, because that's what reality is, you know, is, is, is a kind of uh, joy, maybe, you know. Buddha says so anyway. <laughs> that's what he says. Oh, that's so great. Wonderful. So, so um, isn't it fun that you can meet all these people? You're in Parkland. And where else are you going on your trip? Where, where else can we find you online? Well, I'm not going anywhere, <laughs> literally. No, I know, but I'm saying, no, I yeah. mean, your virtual yeah. trip. My virtual trip, yeah. yeah. What other things are coming up? Where else are you going? Are you going to go to the West Coast? Are you going to be yeah. invited <laughs> by, for, for, a, for a podcast with, uh, with um, what, uh, Buddha Fest? Or are you going to be present in that? You were, you were in uh, Ojai. Uh, well, you and I were just in, yeah, in Maui together. Because yeah, well, we did, did someone said we weren't anywhere. <laughs> some, someone to say there were ten thousand people online for yeah. that event. So the, you, uh, you met ten thousand people and you talked to them, and you shared with them. And I hope that they heard. About, I'm, I'm sure they heard about your book. I hope so. So there, you know, what I'm saying, it's wonderful that you can do what you have tirelessly. And everyone is always like, Sharon, how can she do it? And go everywhere, seeing everyone, going, going everywhere where people are suffering, where people are, where need encouragement. And Sharon is there, you know. You're like, you've, you've been like, you know, you've been like that bunny in the ad for the battery. You know, the, 
<laughs> the Energizer Bunny. You've been the meditation That's why I talk bunny. about rest all the time. Cause I'm like, That's oh. right. And, <laughs> and, and now you can do that. Yeah. The point is, now you're home in peaceful yeah. setting. Yeah. Yeah. Just across the building from Joseph's like porch. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then and then you can still go there. Yeah. And meet the people in Hawaii or overseas yeah. Yeah. without having to get on the plane and listen to the person angrily shutting up somebody else. <laughs> you know, all of the things that we have from yeah. your different yeah. anecdotes. Oh yeah. That's wonderful, really. I'm no, so happy, happy for you. Thank you. Well, I do have a lot of events that I'm all doing them all from here. And uh, it's just on my website, SharonSalzberg.com. So, yes, oh, okay. this very week I'm, like, going, to, so to speak, to Cambridge and to Berkeley. And to, oh, wonderful. Uh, it's all over the place. And, and That's so really great. my uh, intention, my hope, is to work really, really hard until the election. Yeah. And, you know, because part of uh, what I'm trying to do is encourage people to vote and and so yes. we'll make sure that happens, and then I'll take a break after the election. Yes. I like this real series. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Well, that, I mean, How this, about next book, Real Reality? <laughs> well, somebody, well, this title was honestly a joke because we didn't know no, what else I to call it. it. And uh, it stuck. So someone said, how about real life for the next one? So that's close to real yeah. reality. Yeah, that is. Real life would be good. If you if you want to stick with the real thing, <laughs> yeah, it's hard to conceptualize another book. Are you working you on a book right now? Oh yeah, you know, well, I'm my everything. I I am uh, my own popular writing is stuck in a certain way. I don't know why. It's my own weird fault, karma. And um, well, I have a book in the press, you know, but it's not going out just yet. The whole topic is, of course, how to generate the inner joy that wells up from within the subtle nervous system, you know, Tantra, area of Tantra, within the subtle nervous system so as to have the energy to cope with the, with the world, you know, like the Siddhas did, which I'm not a Siddha, so I can't really do, but maybe someone will read it and be able to do it in the future is the reason to bring this knowledge out of Tibetan and Sanskrit into the modern world. And, you know, I've discovered what, I would, what I've come to call Tantric Abhidharma, which is a huge body of literature, actually. But they just don't call it Abhidharma in respect for the old in individual vehicle, what I call, like to call the individual vehicle, you know, the foundation vehicle, to call it uh, the... So that's the Abhidharma, right, you know? And there was one or two Mahayana Abhidharma books that they used there. But even Nagarjuna's book is not called Abhidharma. But it is, of course, Abhidharma. You know, the, all the great masters and writers. Shantideva, that's Abhidharma, really. And, but they don't use the term. And even no one would ever think to use the term tantric abhidharma. But uh, I, was, I, I was telling students today in my class that I'm doing a kind of teacher training thing that I've decided the Tibetans' uh, understanding of the, the three vehicles, you know, the foundation vehicle, the universal, the, you know, the messianic vehicle, you could say, and then the esoteric Vajrayana vehicle. They talk about the coordination of the three vehicles. And what they mean is it's all fulfilled in the final highest Vajrayana. <laughs> but I, I got into t terrible arguments with some of them by saying you're wrong. Because then do if you say that, you're accusing Buddha of not having shared the knowledge of Tantrayana even, even in the, in the foundation vehicle. But maybe not pushing it on people. So it's kind of hinted there in a certain way. And uh, so what I'm saying is, you know, the, you know in the... The creation stage, you know, is before the like high final stage for perfection stage, which I'm translating nowadays. But uh, but I'm saying that if, from tantric point of view, the Theravada is creation stage practice. It's creation stage, you know. And I and I it's very I can put it to very clear. This is just for fun. I we more or less finished. Everybody's fine and they're all happy. And then, and this is, but I'm I'm happy to share this with you. Like the five aggregates, right? The Panjaskanda, you know? And if, if someone hasn't identified inside themselves the aggregate of feelings and of creation and mental functions and of conceptualizations and of matter and then consciousness and then all the elaborateness within consciousness, if they haven't identified these things internally, 
then they go and say they're old deities. What does that mean? They don't even know what they are. You know, how can who can differentiate really between conceptualization and Vedana, which I still want to translate as sensations rather than feelings, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. feelings being emotions, you know, in English. But but they can't really tell the difference. So then what, what's going on to say one is Radha Sambhava and one is uh, Amitabha? Like, what is that? It means nothing. So to really learn about yourself, that's the foundational thing. And if you haven't learned mm -hmm. what the content of your mind is with these brilliant, marvelous, amazing things, and, and the visualizations like of the Kisnayatana, I don't know, Pali, Kisnayatana, you know, where you see everything as earth or everything as mm -hmm. skeletons or everything as water, you know, which are like visualizations, actually, really, in Theravada. They have everything. And they're developing the tremendous samadhi power and concentration and everything, right? The realization of impermanence is an essential realization, and it also... Uh, is concurrent with realizations about conditionality and interconnection. And, you know, so impermanence doesn't mean there's no cause and effect. There's no, everything's just kind of haphazard. Uh, and I think we can easily take it to mean that, you know, but um, there is, in fact, kind of cause and effect. There's conditionality. There's relationship. There's relatedness in this universe. And so... Uh, if I do nothing to try to make a difference, that registers as nothing, <laughs> you know, rather than a seed that gets planted that may go through various iterations and obstacles and, you know, alterations and, and whatever, but is actually a seed planted. And so I think it's, there's so much that uh, kind of um, awakened mind might, be holding or or referencing in in activism impermanence is one uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and part of that is that things aren't necessarily going to change on our timetable you know that i mean several people have said things to me lately about um and I, this is also in my book that some things are not a one generation fix mm -hmm. you know that uh a friend of mine who's uh, maybe my oldest friend, you know, would say, um, it may not be in my lifetime that I see the, the result of this, but nonetheless, it's essential that I do whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and many people have, have said to me that They've learned to refer to their sense of purpose and, and the fulfillment of that sense of purpose rather than the result. Because sometimes you don't get to see the result or you don't get to see it right away. And so mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's a mix of impermanence and conditionality and recognizing that our acts are still powerful. They're still impactful, mm -hmm. even when we don't have mm -hmm. that great, mm -hmm. wonderful satisfaction of seeing it make a difference right away. Right. Sharon, do you That's, want me to say something too? Yeah, about that? please do. So, because I, I, I think it will come back to the same thing. What I want to say is that actually activism comes, real activism, effective, comes from in knowledge of impermanence. In the Abhidharma, uh, compassion can only, has to always be, which is kind of a, a feeling, like emotional commitment to finding, based on empathy, of finding the unbearability of someone else's suffering, or compassion for yourself, is recognizing that you should try to get rid of your suffering and trying to give yourself a break. So, which Sharon is very good on that one. So, so without the wisdom of, compa of every impermanence, according to the Abhidhamma, then there can be no valid compassion, because although there can be sympathy, the, the condition of the suffering person seems to be unchangeable to the person and then they wouldn't have activism so therefore what 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 uh, what compa what uh, what what, it, the, what knowledge of impermanence makes you realize that this person is now suffering but they can change so then you want to make them have a real change and that means you are an activist to imp to help cause that change whether you f you succeed or not you feel compelled to do it and you have a power because you can visualize them in a free state. 
from this chain, from their suffering. If you, without the knowledge of impermanence, you kind of think everything the way it appears to you immediately is just the way it always going to be. So you feel stuck and incapable of doing anything and then no compassion will arise in you. And the sympathy will be almost a kind of ratifying the other person, you know, patronizing, rat ratifying the other person in that bad state that they can't be changed. Nothing I can do about it. So you feel powerless. And that's not compassion. Compassion is power. And so compassion is making change into real change. <laughs> nice. I guess I do believe we can heal the polarization, but in all honesty, the main thrust of my energy or my dedication um, is, is more toward trying to make sure everybody votes, you know, <laughs> and, and that people are engaged because it's one thing to, heal polarization and it's another thing to uh, not do everything one can to see that policies enacted for example sort of take care of people I and mean, look what's happening you know and and uh, you know I think we we have a responsibility if we are American citizens if we have the ability to vote um, to actually do that and mm -hmm. uh, you know, what happens in terms of reconciliation or, or the end of polarization, I think is, there's going to be a time for that, but it, it's going to be a different time, you know, <laughs> uh, because I think it's just so essential. You can have enormous compassion for somebody and decide, you know what, I don't want you legislating <laughs> choices for me, you know, exactly. like with your particular value system or whatever, you know. Everybody is around here is a Leo. Uh, Michelle and I are both Leos, and I know we all that's going to get it done. So, so, and Sharon, I just reminding me, talking with you, how much I do enjoy teaching with you. And I hope we soon get a chance, you know. Well, and thank all my, you. All my love. And a big air hug. Air hug to you, okay? All right. Big air hug. Air hug. The Bob Thurman Podcast is brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Menla membership community and listeners like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership and how to support this podcast, please visit our website at tibethouse.us. Tashi Delek, and thanks for tuning in.